As part of our Love Your Parks tour, fine art nature photographer Margo Carrera sent us on a mission to document and gather as many stories about America's gardens as possible. So we asked her, well, do we have to do botanical gardens, just botanical gardens, community gardens? She said all gardens, and especially ones that are in parks and wilderness areas in our public lands. And today's story is all about wildflowers of Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge in Southern Arizona. Um, so when we think about coming home to Tucson, basically the first place we think of is going to Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge. It's a special place that Nancy and I discovered way back when, Nancy, way back when? We don't have to go so far back. Yeah, when we were very young. Uh, anyway, no, it is really one of our special, special places to visit and explore. And we're very excited to have Wildlife Refuge Specialist Joshua Smith join us today to talk about the different terrain, habitat, the landscape, because it changes so much. I mean, we're talking, I believe, over 117,000 acres. Right, Josh? Welcome. How are you? <laughs> I'm well. Thank you, Lisa and Nancy. Um, it's uh, 117,680 some. We generally just round up to 118,000 acres. Wow. Really? That's mm -hmm. crazy. I mean, it's amazing. Cool. I know that we we discovered it on a trip. Um, we went on a media trip um, in August one year. I'm going to say it was, no, I can't even think back, um, at least at, at about 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. We were going through a motto and to McCockery National Historical Park and, uh, you know, all, all through Santa Cruz County, south of Tucson, everyone, it's about an hour. And we saw in the brochure in one of the B&Bs that, hey, there's this wildlife refuge. And we're like, listen, you guys can all do your thing and get up late, but we're, we're hightailing it over here. And it turned out to be this magical oasis out in Arabaca and at the Cienega. And of birds, we saw vultures, we saw vermilion flight catchers, we saw sunflowers. We were like, are you kidding me? This should be like on everyone's bucket list to go to. Not just go to a park, but this is a bucket list destination. It was so magical. Uh, so, you know, there's that, but you also have this other huge part of the park. So it's not just the Cienega. Um, you have a, you have rivers, you have mountains, and you have, isn't it like one of the largest grasslands or semi Arid grasslands? One of the largest ungrazed semi arid, semi desert grasslands in uh, remaining in, I don't know if it's just southern Arizona or if it's in the U.S. Mm. Wow. Um, the, B, the big designator there is it's, it's ungrazed. Oh, that, that is actually unique, That's right? That's nice. Because half of the places you hike in, here comes the cattle. You I know, know they <laughs> You're do. like, hi. It's you, like, hello. They want to come hang out at your picnic. So, yeah. but, but that's interesting because the grassland, it's, it's in Sasabe, right, where your headquarters are. And did I say that correctly? Very near to Sasabe, yes. Uh, okay. We're seven and a half miles north of Sasabe on Highway 286. And how far from Tucson do you think that is? It's an hour, right? About 60 miles? Hour, hour 15. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's interesting because when we first met you, and normally we are out in the refuge with you when we do these interviews, which is far cooler because there's birds and it's just like cool. Um, but you came from Hawaii at one point, right? To here. Correct. So, correct. I, I moved to the refuge from the big island of Hawaii. So this is a big difference in, in a lot of ways, right? In this, except for the mountains. Well, it is, except that I, I grew up in Arizona, uh, and so this is this is a homecoming, if you will. Hmm. And so this is this is my old stomping grounds. I came here to the refuge on a college field trip for one of oh, my wow. conservation techniques classes. Wow! Wow! Nice. Okay. And I know that you work uh, with pollinators, right? I, I remember you showing me you know, stick your finger in the cactus flower and see what happens <laughs> kind of thing. So uh, this yeah. was awesome. This, we made this amazing video of wildflowers. And um, it's something that I realized that I've been photographing a lot every time I go to the refuge is all these plants and flowers. And um, one thing we noticed making the video is it's really not a video just on all the flower power that you have out there, but it's a lot of bug power. <laughs> so it seems like if you have flowers, um, that this is a good thing that you've become like you're like a pollinator heaven out there. Like really, yeah. everybody's coming and landing. It absolutely turns out that bugs make the world go round. Um, so in Hawaii, the study I was on was evaluating native pollinators and how they were impacted by non-native 
invasive predators, uh, mainly other insects. And, um, you know, through all of my work with insects, it's, it's become very clear that almost, almost all of life would disappear without insects. <laughs> Wow. Isn't that wild? Like, yeah, that, because and that's what people are scared of. Is well, insects. yeah, and we're all like, no, get rid of the insects, and like, no, you need them. Wow. Yeah. What can you give us a reason of why we need insects, so that we understand that as, as mm. you know, when we get freaked out, oh, there's a bee, kill it, or no, there's a spider, kill it. Why well, sure. We uh, the the majority of plants are are pollinated by insects. Uh, some are wind pollinated, but for, by, by and large insects do do the deed if if it has a visible flower there is a an insect or in some cases a bird that moves that pollen to another flower and mm -hmm. if that didn't happen there wouldn't be a whole lot to eat because even if you were to go full paleo and eat nothing but meat it, you know the meat's got to eat something <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, right yeah, exactly yeah yeah. Okay. Every, every, everything eats plants ultimately, and without insects, we wouldn't have a lot of plants. And they're cool to watch too, man. They're just so like the bugs are a trip. We have, um, and I think it's a desert broom bush that I filmed. I, I didn't know, and it was the first time Nancy and I drove Pronghorn Drive, and they're pronghorn on Pronghorn Drive. Sometimes you're lucky to see them, <laughs> but they are there. Um, and there was this big tree bush thing with white. Now, right now, where we are in Tucson, we have all these little like white spiders flying in the sky, but they're not spiders. They're little seedlings, you know, from the they desert look room. Like dandelions. Yeah. Not. And so now I think that's the same, you know, from what I've been looking at. I don't know. But I mean, there are all these different species of beetles and butterflies. And I don't know what they are, but when you start to see like it, at least five species on one plant. Isn't that pretty cool? Does that mean that's healthy? It is pretty cool, and it, it is a good indicator of a, a healthy system. Um, well, I mean, I guess on the other hand, if, if that's all they have, it would be unhealthy, but really desert broom is one of those special plants in that it and a few other plants on the refuge flower in the fall. Mm. And you know, usually you expect flowers in the spring. Well, here right. we do things a little bit differently. We get some in the spring. We get most of them in the summer, and then we get a a good push of these plants that pollinate in the fall. And they're important for migrating pollinators because at that time of the year, there's almost nothing else out there for them to eat. <laughs> mm. And so, yeah. desert broom is one of those fantastic late flowering plants that really serves a lot of purposes on our refuge. Uh, it's cover for quail, it's food for pollinators, it's it's places for birds to roost and hide. Uh, and they vary in size from, you know, really small to as big as a Volkswagen beetle. Uh, they, there's a lot of variation on that, on that plant. And mm -hmm. as you've indicated right now, they're all going to seed. And so there's all these beautiful little white mm -hmm. fluff balls flying through the sky. They look cool. like little parachutes. And there's butterflies out. I know um, in everyone we're taping this recording uh, or this interview, um, but there's butterflies right now. And it's like we're, we're almost at the end of December here, but we're seeing butterflies. And I don't remember butterflies being out in December. Is that normal? <laughs> I mean, has this just been an unusual year weather-wise? It has been a, an unusual year. Um, in the past 10 years, We've had probably five rain events in October, and then this year we had five rain events in October, which resulted in almost five inches of rain. And anytime it rains, the desert, or in our case, the semi-desert, responds, and the plants mm -hmm. respond. And we had another terrific bloom of everything greening up and everything flowering, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been a really unusual year. Uh, but, you know, there's... As long as there's something out there for them to eat, there will be butterflies. And hmm. thanks to that late rain, there's there's flowers now. I think I think next year is going to be really cool because we have more rain in the forecast. And I I just I mean I know don't count your chickens till they hatch, but like I'm kind of feeling or quail in your case, um, I'm feeling that we're going to have a really good bloom come 2019. What do you feel? 
I'm optimistic. You know, you can almost yeah. never pr- accurately predict a super bloom, mm. but we have the recipe for it. We had multiple rain events, which triggered multiple flowerings, which puts out a lot of seed for next spring. Mm. And so if we get adequate winter rains and adequate spring, uh, even a little bit of spring rain, I would anticipate that we'll just be covered up in wildflowers. Cool. Uh, and, and next- the other side of that, though, is that the grass is tall when we get a lot of rain. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. grass is often taller than wildflowers. Mm. I've seen that out there, actually. I've seen that where you've got the poppies in, in between. You know, so it's really interesting over the years going through footage and and getting to see the different cycles. I just think the pronghorn could eat the grass so we could see the wildflower. Yeah, come on, pronghorn, get out there and do your job. Well, <laughs> I think we may we may have talked about this before, but pronghorn don't really eat grass. They're not deer. They eat the forbs. Deer don't eat the deer don't really eat grass either. Um in a in a real pinch they will, but they uh they prefer forbs and and fresh leaves and flowers and fruits. So who's going to eat the grass? The locusts? Um, well, I don't think we're going to get cattle or bison anytime soon, so nobody. Oh, cool. I'd like to have to see the, the grasshoppers oh. will eat the grass. Okay, so, yeah, the grasshoppers. It's go back to, and the back to bugs. It's and the pig go back to, to the, the bugs. bugs. The pigweed, the locusts mm-hmm. come out. Now, the forbs, I want to talk about that. Um, something you showed us, you were doing burns out there and you took us out and showed us like, mm-hmm. now this is cool. We have these plants coming in. These are forbs. This means it's worked. So the forbs are like, aren't they part of the cycle of nitrogen and, and making the soil good? Well, after a burn, the forbs are the, like the first successional plant. The, as soon as the, as soon as the burn is stopped the first little bit of moisture it gets everything kind of springs forth with new growth and and you'll you'll see the response from the deer and the pronghorn is is almost immediate they'll move into an area that's burned almost as soon as it's done burning Hmm. in anticipation of these forbs um as far as nitrogen fixing they uh some forbs do some forbs don't uh we have a lot of leguminous uh, plants in the fabaceae family the kind of little mesquite beanie type things mm. that uh will fix nitrogen and, and the birds and the deer they they eat all of that as well wow. but uh forbs forbs is just a fancy word for weeds but they're pretty <laughs> They're pretty. You got pretty weeds, you know, and you got pretty like squash it. too. I like it. I well, like the squash that goes clean, across the road. No, if you don't clean out your garden, you can go. Those are forbs. Yeah. They're there special. you go. They're and good for And that's how the magazine life. was created. It's a magazine of weeds. No, anyway, sorry. Go <laughs> Silliness, silliness. But, but okay. So we talk about not being a grazed uh, grassland, and this mm. is an important part of it. Mm-hmm. And. So I need to bring that conversation to light because when we look at wildflowers and things growing and being in their natural state, this is something that that's why you're working at at, at doing these burns and, and specific things. So when people see you like, hey, on Facebook and everyone, you've got to follow the refuge on Facebook. So it's facebook.com forward slash Buenos Aires NWR. And we are in Southern Arizona, not Buenos Aires. Um, but it is named for a good reason because there's beautiful breezes. And um, but the history of this land is you're basically reclaiming the land, right, and and uh, restoring it uh, back from the grazing period, right, and also helping we're, the quail. We're trying. Um, mm-hmm. Invasive grasses are, are a real challenge in that one, they were brought here in aerial broadcast on purpose, with mm. the sole intent of feeding cattle. And so to get rid of these grasses, it's a really, really long process and success is not even guaranteed. We basically burn the units on a three to five year ratio to knock back the invasive grasses and allow the native grasses a chance to replenish the seed bank. Mm -hmm. And so they lay more seed and hopefully in the next three to five years, the invasive comes back just a little bit less and then we do it again and hopefully Mm -hmm. you know it's more native and less invasive each time you do it but it's a really long drawn out process Mm. wow so how do you um 
But so when an invasive species comes in, it I, you kind of have to bolster the native species to outdo the invasive. Yeah, and this is like military operations. Well, no, and it, I mean it. It is interesting because um, you know invasive species that grab a foothold have some talent that that. Um, it makes them the, more competitive. Yeah. And so there's something that happens where your natural plant that belongs there needs to stand up and go, oh, no, you don't. But it, get off you know, my land. Yeah, and it's interesting. But, you know, when you say when the invasive comes in, it, it is it more how they came in? Like when you say aerial broadcasts and things like that. That's well, it depends on how much comes in at the time. A lot yeah. of times an invasive species will show up and it's just a couple seeds on somebody's boot. Yeah. You know, and then that one little tuft takes hold and goes unnoticed for a couple years. And by the time it's noticed, it's had a chance to broadcast millions of seeds. Okay. So this is a good point of yeah. why, like you have, as you drive into the refuge on the Sassabee side, um, that you have the side like this is the riparian habitat like you know no one's allowed to walk around there kind of deal this is you know sensitive areas and so even if you had a footpath around that that could disturb that because of the you know what we track in because especially you know here we're hikers we like to go out in nature you know i know our audience does but a lot of times we'll go from one park to the next and you know last park could have been in texas and we brought you something from texas did you want that <laughs> you know what i mean and that's a you know, that's a very important point is um, a lot of times we ourselves are the vector for these things. Mm. Um, right now, a good example is is we're, we're battling buffalo grass. Buffalo grass has come in in mm. uh, pretty strong force this past year, stronger than it had been in the past. And where did, where did the seed come from, right? Well, mm. Tucson Mountains, everything to the north, they're battling buffalo grass. Uh, south of the border, they're battling mm. buffalo grass. So it could have come across the border. Wow. Or it could have come down on a Border Patrol vehicle. It could have come down on a visitor's vehicle. It could have been on some hunter's boot. Mm. Wow. But yeah. it's it's spreading quickly. And so we've got to really gather it up and try to stop it from spreading and keep it from getting outside the realm of possible uh mm. at, at some point you know you, you there's too much and you, mm. there's not a lot you can do about it, it but you know there's no we, we we wouldn't be good biologists if we just gave up <laughs> yeah well, I, this reminds me uh, and when we lived in south africa there's a, a cosmos is a flower there and it, it, there's fields of them. They're beautiful for sure. People go out to see them. I used to paint a whole bunch of, made a lot of money painting pictures of them. And I was really shocked one time to find out that they were not native. And yeah, I was like, where did they come from? Australia. And they came in bags of horse feed. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But there it was, and so it, this whole thing happened with people feeding their horses, and here comes this flower seed that doesn't uh, belong there. Yeah, but it because it was pretty, nobody went, oh, let's not have it. Who knows what's because, happening now? Yeah, I don't know, but it, it's an interesting thing. And then I'm thinking, okay, now the horse is going to eat it, and then he's going to poop it out later, and then it's going to go somewhere <laughs> it's gonna else. It's going to poop flowers. Yes. <laughs> no, well, I mean, you know, and so here, and and it was one of the things that people went to see, and then it was like, oh, well, it doesn't really belong there. I'm like, oh, mm. oops. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Like, I wonder in our wildflower video how much is like that is a native or not. You know, I, I geek out oh. on that, and you don't, it's so... There's so many flowers that you have mm. that it's like, wow, they're all pretty to me, you know, but, it, you know, there may be the buffalo grass in there, and I don't know. But actually, we had buffalo grass in South Africa and buffalo, uh, buffalo over there. Mm. But um, I I saw on your Facebook that you've been doing all kinds of volunteer efforts to get this, right? And not just, you know, with the, the staff at uh, the refuge, but you seem to have like a nice group of people helping you. We do, and we can always use more. Um, it's, uh, we, I would say that, gosh, more than 60% of the work that we accomplish is done by volunteers. Wow. Uh, 
That's volunteers amazing. are really important to the refuge system and even the park system, BLM, all, all of the mm -hmm. federal land management agencies and even the state agencies mm -hmm. rely heavily on volunteers. And uh, I just happen to be really lucky that I have a great force of volunteers that work with us here. Mm. Is that all through the uh, Friends of Buenos Aires uh, National Wildlife Refuge? I watch them on Facebook too. And I don't know, I'm, I'm addicted to you guys' Facebook pages because you see updates on the refuge and you're like, I want to be back there now. <laughs> but it seems like there's a lot of work going on that you clean the highways, that there's, you know, there's all kinds of projects going on also with kids doing things. In the, and there's, there's been some upgrades happening over there uh, on the Sassabi side, right? And also on the um, Aravaca side too, it looks like. We're doing our best, you know, and uh, and back to your question, yes, the friends are a big, a big help in organizing a lot of these volunteer groups. They're uh, volunteers themselves, and they've, they've been an amazing asset to us, and, and also in helping to create these upgrades. You know, we're modifying fence along the highway. We created a, a, a uh, dedicated group campsite for, you know, environmental groups and hunt groups and scout groups and really you know big groups to camp together mm -hmm. um you know we're also doing a lot of this invasive species control uh mm -hmm. mesquite trees are ubiquitous in southern arizona but they're invasive to this grassland and so wow. we're doing a lot of in invasive mesquite control mm -hmm. um and again it's it's all being driven largely by volunteers and wow. so pretty awesome it's been it just seems like you know since we've connected with you and, and started getting active, you know, in covering the refuge that we've just watched it grow and grow and grow in activity in regards to people taking care of it. And I think that's so important and, and just a special thing because it's really a special place. When we were talking at the beginning of the show, I'm like, I mean it. Like when I think home of Tucson, so the first thing I think of is getting down to Buenos Aires. I, every time we go out to, you know, go to the refuge to see you or go hiking or get out there like I can barely sleep at night because I know where we're going and it's like dude this is like my game drive in Africa you know it's just it like does, the coolest it is very much like Africa. very much like Africa but there's mm -hmm. this what I think is so amazing and now that you know we never used to go to the Sassabi side we we're always like go to the Sienega and, and then maybe go to the creek side too which is so different and the creek side is so different from the Sienega and then you go to Sassabi it's completely different and then you have Browns Canyon which is really different so that is, I think, what's so unique is that it seems that you have four major habitats, or there are more than I'm thinking of, like just like regions that are completely different from each other. Well, we we call it three habitat management units. So we have Brown Canyon, we have the Grassland Unit, and then we have the Aravaca Creek Unit, which is our riparian corridor. Mm -hmm. um, but within the units, there are significant differences you know within the grassland you know, on the southern end you've got higher more rocky more rolly craggy stuff that has a lot of yucca and ocotillo in it and then to the north it's more flat and just big spread out plains of mesquite trees and grasses and it's it's got its own flavor each different part of the uh the refuge and uh it's 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 a delight to be able to explore it and really just get around like on the east side it's all foothills and and canyons um it's, it's a cool place to explore and yeah, you, and your wildlife can go from bears down to quaddies you know like bear brown bears or was it bears black, I'm gonna black get it bears. wrong black bears gotta get oh we're not in california they don't have them either <laughs> but anyway so you got your bears in browns canyon and that's something that is off limits except for special hikes, right, or environmental groups. I know that, you know, you've got an educational center there, but it's really, this is a protected habitat, and unless you're part of an environmental group, you're, you're not going to get in, or unless you go on a hike, right? That's correct. It's accompanied access only, um, mm -hmm. or we do allow uh, special work groups, people that are coming out and doing service <laughs> projects with us. Nancy and Lisa. 
Nancy and Lisa, we want Nancy. in. We want in. <laughs> <laughs> We're special. Come on. I'm, I'm sure we could work something out as a service project type thing. Ooh. Ooh. I'll go clean the highway. I will. You have no idea. If you need ditches dug, uh, grass taken and highway cleaning, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm serious. Whatever you need me to do, I'll do it. Um, but the, I thought what was so neat there when you took us up there that it just had this history. There was like this history of people being part of that. It's like there's ranching history too, obviously, which is what Buenos Aires comes from is, you know, a ranch. Um, but it's, isn't it all different ranches that kind of make it up as into one refuge? That's kind of why it's all different. It's all different parcels of land coming together. It is. It is. And so the, the initial purchase was for a rather large ranch, which made up probably 80% of the current refuge. And then we just kind of picked up parcels within our acquisition boundary around that. Mm. That's nice because mm. then you've got like the corridor, right, for the wildlife and for just keeping it all together. It's neat. So the Browns Canyon was neat. Is You showed us an oak tree. It, this was an, like an ancient oak, right? This was a big tree. Am I even right about the species name now? There was like this old tree on the way in. So that was a giant tree. mesquite tree. Mesquite. See, I knew I was going to be wrong. And, anyway, uh, as I said that. It, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have no way to, to age that tree, but it was massive i want to say 15 feet around it was a, 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 one of the biggest probably the biggest mesquite tree i've ever seen um mm -hmm. unfortunately during the uh, big wet period we had this year that tree actually split in half and <gasps> half of it fell to the ground wow wow and uh even even still it's an impressively large tree even at half the size it was and you know, and, and things happen with the dead parts of of trees and limbs and oh, things like that. Trees. Animals do it. Yep. Bugs, back, bugs. Back to the bugs. Uh, the yep. bugs are our primary decomposers, and yep. bugs and fungi. And so that tree will be returned to the earth. Wow! And They're the this is you know, I, I know you know what, over 340 bird species between the entire. I mean, when you look at all the different mm. parts of of you know, the refuge. And Browns Canyon, uh, you do do hikes, right? Is that through the Friends Group or Audubon Society that you do? No, that's through me. Um, oh, Josh, you get to hike with Josh. Listen, going out November. with Josh is cool. You get to see all kinds of cool stuff. It's fun. Well, it's, it's not always with me. I, I have volunteers who lead a lot of the hikes, and they do a really great job. Uh, you know, back to volunteers helping us out. Yeah. Uh, occasionally, I, I do lead hikes, though, and um, I'm the one who coordinates the hikes coordinates the reservations, sets everything up. And so if you want to go on a Brown Canyon hike November through April, uh, I'm the guy. Right on. We got to do that. We got to do that. That's good. It is so beautiful. And yeah. and when we went with you in that one spring, I mean, you're like, this is the time to do the hike, man. Look at the wildflowers. You're going to miss it if you don't do it. And we missed it because our life is so crazy. But Honestly, the the beauty, the wildflowers, when you start to see them, it changes from when you are down on the on the, in the grasslands. You know, it changes, and when you go in, like the sunflowers, we did get to see the sunflowers at the end of October. We did like, oh, we have a day off suddenly. What are we gonna do? Duh, <laughs> get in the car and go. And it just the sunflowers this year at the Cienega were just amazing. I mean, they're so tall and. You are walking in a corridor and all everything was going to seed at the time. We had that like one, it was just that cool time to go. You know, a lot of people go where everything's thriving and alive, but there was that period of it was getting cold. Let's not, and there was let, all the seeds, all these seeds not flying around. Leave out the biggest tarantula ever. Nancy. Oh my. Freaked. Oh, that was a <laughs> trip beforehand, another biggest, like wild trip. Yes. She, I've, she was quiet. <laughs> I am quiet. She, she, I were going on the Cienega, going around the Cienega, and normally we've seen hawks in in there, and we've um, cardinals, tanagers, all kinds of sparrows, um, hummingbirds, and when you hike through that area, you start to know who, what, and where, when. You know, Vanderpeppel is at the one side. You know, you hear them, and anyway, we're walking. And all of a sudden I hear, <gasps> and I'm like, oh, oh, snake, you know, that's my thing. No, she didn't even know what to say. There's this giant tarantula, you know, and we're just looking at it. It was the coolest thing. And she's like, get down, 
get yeah. down and photograph it. Get get down to the tarantula. And I'm like, dude, there's a line. Because what if I can't get back up, Josh? You know, seriously, <laughs> it was that huge, dude. That was the coolest tarantula ever. It was wider than my foot. It, and was, it was so high off the ground. I mean, it it's not like a flat spider. I was like. And I almost stepped on it, and and I saw it just as I was going to put my foot down, and I veered over to the side, and I'm like, "What is that?" I and I'm like, "I should know. We lived in Africa. These things are big, but this is the biggest spider I've seen." And in that this is the coolest spider ever. It was, and he was cool, man. He put his little front leggies up, like, "Don't you step on me, dude." Seriously, awesome. I know people get freaked out, and then some a couple came through, and I'm like, dude, watch out for the tarantula, like just so they don't step on it. And they're like, cool man, a tarantula. And then I, a lot of times you put that on Facebook or something, oh. people are like, eh, no, no. But that is the but coolest it was thing. Really big. Sorry, but like your tarantulas rock. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yes. I mean, what are they doing? They, I know they burrow, right? So they burrow, they're like ground, and then here comes the tarantula wasp that tries to take them out. Like, how does that happen? Yeah, really. So they do burrow, and if you are walking along and you see a, a hole in the ground, and it's a jagged hole, it's probably a tarantula hole. If it's a smooth, round hole, it's probably a snake or a lizard. Oh, oh nice. Nice, nice to know. And so snake-wise, like, are you seeing as things – start to change with the flowers, the plants, the forbs, and, you know, as the grassland starts to, you know, do its turn, and restoration is a long process. Are you seeing reptiles change over? I know you have a lot of stink bugs, too. They're cool. Oh, but are you yeah. seeing a change in the bugs, like like the spiders and all the things people don't want to talk about, but we do? <laughs> you know, I don't think that I have the, the time and, and depth of knowledge yet to, to, okay. to recognize the change. Uh, I, I've been here uh, two short years now, yeah. or two and a quarter years now, and you know, these are things that you have to observe for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, this year was completely different than last year, so it's like you have an anomalous year like this that really just kind of blows the rules out of the water. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, yeah. right? And yeah. then the year before, you had a Gary Lake fill up you know it's it's been an interesting couple of years honestly you know when you look at how the refuge is and you just watch the changes and um, I just encourage everyone to go in this in the wildflowers like we're saying right now things are still blooming here um, so maybe you know when we think about wildflower season it's really spring through fall but spring could start early and fall could stay as late as it wants right that's right yeah. the nice well, thing about Arizona is uh, our our seasons kind of blend together. You said you know, blend. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know it's a big blend. It, it, it is, and nature See what I did doesn't. There? <laughs> well yeah, done. You did good. Well done. Nature doesn't really read calendar. No, it, it's the other way around. Nature makes them. Uh, that's it. Now I got. I got to go back to you. When the, I think it was the first time we came to meet you, and you had. People with balls of clay. What were they? Were they seed balls? Like seed balls. Oh yeah, cool. And so, so is that for grass? Uh, grasses and shrubs. And so what we do is we take the seeds from the plants we want out there, the native desirable plants, and we ball them up in a clay and sand mix, mm. and we deposit them across the landscape. Um, you may have noticed out here we have a lot of harvester ants. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You know, you see a big clear spot covered in ants. Those those are harvester ants. And if we were to just spread seed, well, it would all get eaten by birds and harvester ants. Yep. So we protect them in these clay balls. And then when the rains come, it spreads out the clay and the plants, the seeds germinate and grow from these balls. It's amazing. Um, and it's, it's a good, it's a, it works pretty well. Um, it's time consuming, but at the same time, once you make them into a little ball, you can throw them a whole lot easier than you can just <laughs> plain seeds. And so it's a little more fun. I think it's cool. cool. I want to go do it. Like I know people who do that Good. just to grow their wildflowers and their mm -hmm. gardens and stuff. They do these, you know, the clay balls or seed balls. And the other thing too, the one thing I want to touch on is the, is it the Pima pineapple cactus? Am I getting right that you have like... Uh, yep. And uh, so Pima pineapple cactus is a uh, endangered 
species here on the refuge. It's, uh, I think it's pretty exclusively found in Pima County. Hmm. Um, although I don't think that the county name has anything to do with the naming of the of the plant, hmm. but uh, it's an interesting plant in that it is very dependent on a certain soil type. It's very dependent on jackrabbits as seed dispersers. It's very dependent on termites as seed planters. That's uh, really interesting how that works. So wow. the jackrabbit eats the fruit and then he mm -hmm. deposits the seeds in his dropping and mm -hmm. then a termite encapsulates that dropping in soil and eats the dropping but leaves the seed and the seed is then planted. Wow. It's an interesting hey. process and it's all they're all connected. Yeah. And um wow. and so the Pima pineapple cactus is an interesting plant and because it's so reliant on so many other factors it's uh mm it presents its own set of challenges. And so um, I'll go ahead and plug an event we have coming up. We're doing some Pima pineapple cactus surveys coming up on January 8th, 9th, and 10th. And uh, always looking for volunteers to help us go for long walks in the uh, across the refuge looking for cacti. You said long walks across the refuge looking for cacti. Who doesn't want to do that like now? Like now, you know? Right. To me, the refuge is the coolest place to hide. And, and depending on the time of year, you could see little baby froggy things, little spade toads, right? I didn't know. Spade right? foot toads, correct? Yeah. Spade foot toads. I'm getting there. And you can see dragonflies. And I have photos of swamp flowers. Like, I don't know if they're swamp, swamp flowers, flowers, but I'm like, <laughs> I saw this kind of thing in the Everglades, but the, these are white and so yellow. A little kind of similar. I don't know what I'm looking at, but they're beautiful. And I saw them. You have that little swampy area at the, at the as you drive in through Sasabi towards the headquarters, of the visitor center. These white little flowers, just and dude, I could go on and on and on. As you know, we love the refuge, and it's just it is such a different set of. I mean, as you drive through the Sasabi side and you go in Pronghorn Drive, you will see rolling hills and yeah, mesquites and all of a sudden yuccas coming up and acatillas coming out and then you go down the road and next thing you know you're walking along a shaded creek and you never know what you're going to see in there a cardinal or a gray a gray mm -hmm. hawk you know that's where they like to hang out it's crazy i mean that's amazing you have the best job ever except for ours because we get to go to all parks across the country <laughs> so ours is i'm just saying i would love your job um would you do ours for a week just to go to different parks oh absolutely uh, the opportunity out. to travel and visit all these wonderful places, public lands that the U.S. Oh. has to offer is just incredible. Yeah, we're excited because we get to cover all the wildlife refuges now. And, and I was reading up, you have a ton of them. <laughs> we're we're going to be very busy. Like we thought national park units were a lot. <laughs> then you look at national wildlife refuges. Oh, yeah. we're, 567. It, yep. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And we haven't started the state parks and the community parks. We just decided that every single park is important and they all need to be documented. And that's what we're doing. So that's it. And uh it's a happy life, and we'll just go from park to park and, and hang out with cool rangers like you. And uh, everybody, again, uh, the website, okay, so the website for uh, Buenos Aires is fws.gov forward slash refuge forward slash Buenos underscore Aires, or just go to the Facebook page, Buenos Aires NWR, and you'll find it. It's very cool. You get to watch what's going on with the wildlife cam. You've got the wildlife cam. You know, Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. We love Tuesdays. I've, I've got to get out there and collect it right now after we get uh -oh. done talking. Okay, we'll get off the show right now. <laughs> we'll get off right now. <laughs> but, uh, uh, okay, so you've got hikes in Browns Canyon. The other thing I wanted to plug is you do have bird walks and nature hikes, right? Do you have bird walks that still go on? Correct. So the Tucson Audubon Society puts on a free bird walk at the Aravaca Cienega the first Saturday of each month, November through April. And that's also led oh. by one of our volunteers. Uh, it's a oh. terrific opportunity to get out, learn to bird, see anywhere from 20 to 50 species of birds with a knowledgeable birder who can teach you the ways. Mm. Oh man, it's awesome. You have a bird watching station. Cool. It's so cool. And you will see, you'll be able to watch like loggerhead shrikes mm. do their crazy stuff. They're crazy birds. I think they, they should awesome. be listed as one of the craziest birds. I We've like seen, them. I think we saw Lazuli or Lazuli, however you like it. Lazuli. I don't see. I don't I pronounce know. anything right. That's uh -huh. why we do radio. 
that July bunting the last time we were there. And I'm like, dude, seriously, in warblers and I don't know what I'm looking at half the what time, is, but if there's color I'm in, it's all what is pretty. What the bird that greets you when you go through? The loggerhead, I think. Or the fan of pepla, it depends on the call. No, it's a little brown bird that sits on the sign. Sparrow? No. Oh, the one on you go yeah. into the Sassabee entrance right. that's always sitting on the sign. It's like, yeah. this is the riparian area, and yeah. I'm here, and, and this and is I'm mine. And I'm here as your guide. It's always there. Every time we drive Every through time. into the refuge, that bird is there on the sign going, this is mine. And, and don't walk <laughs> here and bring dirty seeds. <laughs> that's right. No, no dirty seeds. No dirty seats. This is a protected area. So, like, it's so cool. It's a magical place. Uh, everyone, again, uh, we got to give a shout out to our sponsor, uh, Margo Carrera, who wants us to go and document every garden. <laughs> like, uh, you know, why not? And But she's like, oh, of course, parks come first because those are the most natural and most beautiful gardens. Uh, so go to her website, CarreraFineArt.com. Uh, you can also see her Etsy store for nature-inspired gifts and clothing that features her work. And really, ladies, like, there's, like, you can wrap your yourself in nature with these clothes is awesome so it's etsy.com forward slash margo carrera and uh, we're going to play some music it's called time to go and this is from brian borgo and it's go to borgoband.com it's off his latest album demolition you wouldn't think of that when you think of parks but time to go i'm saying it's time to go <laughs> to buenos aires national wildlife refuge and this is a song that is featured in our wild wildflower video for buenos aires national wildlife refuge so mm -hmm. thank you so much josh thank you it's been nice talking with you both i hope to see you out here on the refuge and uh, all of your listeners too come visit us absolutely
Nancy and Lisa, and of course Priscilla, this is nature photographer Margot Carrera. Well done on completing another installment of your garden story series. <laughs>